Well hi folks and welcome to our Sunday video for Sunday the 3rd of April. I hope you're well. Um, just a few announcements before we get going. Firstly to say that you might have seen that the First Minister was making an announcement this week about face masks in places of worship. And so the news is that she has said that from the 4th of April face masks will no longer be needed in places of worship which means that from Sunday the 10th there's no legal requirement for people to wear one. So if you're someone who's been waiting for that news before you come back to church, then uh, that's the news. You, you know, you can come back to church and not wear a mask. That's totally fine. Exactly how we're going to figure out the seating and what we're going to encourage folks to do, if I'm honest, hasn't quite been worked out yet by the elders. I think it's fair to say that no one will be pressured to wear a mask and no one will be pressured not to wear a mask. So we'll see how things go. The elders are meeting on the 11th of April to talk more broadly about the easing of restrictions, about what it means for different aspects of church life, how we might continue with different things or expand out again. And I'll try and bring you news as soon as I can. But that's, I guess, the headline thing from those uh, that announcement this week. And then just to think ahead towards Easter, what we're going to be doing around Easter. So on the Sunday before Easter, Sunday the 10th, in the evening, we have an Easter carol service, we've called it. So it's a bit like a Christmas carol service, I suppose, but not singing Will Come All Ye Faithful. Instead, we'll be singing Easter songs and we'll having readings from the Bible about Easter. We'll be walking through the Easter story from Luke's Gospel. And I hope um, that... Uh, it's a good evening. There'll be song, readings, short reflection on the Easter story and its message. And I think a great time for us just to stop together to worship God and to consider the, the importance of that Easter, first Easter for us today. So that's one thing. The second thing we're doing is that on Good Friday, the 15th, we're having a, what's often called a walk of witness. So we'll be leaving from our Giles Square outside Pontley Town Church, walking down round the harbour into the Market Square, carrying a cross in our group. And then we're going to take a short service as we arrive at the Market Square, really just to um, mark Good Friday, to be a witness to others that this is important to us. And I suppose in another sense, as we walk with the cross, we have a sense of what it was, in a small way, Jesus faced as he was ridiculed, as he approached the cross himself. So, th these are the things we have going for Easter. Of course, we'll have worship on Easter Sunday as well. And there may yet be more things, but these are the things we have so far. I, w I want to encourage you to come if you can to these things. I think there'll be good ways for us to mark Easter. Well, those are our notices for today. Let's now begin uh, with our song. Let's sing together. Thank you. 
has felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore. Our reading today is from Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 32. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him and twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way and from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and the other on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way the chief priests and teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Have you ever stopped and looked at something and and really noticed it in detail and been moved? I think, for example, of the coastline we have around Caithness. Have you ever stopped and looked at the waves, at the sea? I guess a, a glance, you know it's the sea, you know it's blue, but you see so much more when you stop. When you look For a while you see the individual contours of waves as they swell and rise to form that white crest. When you stop you notice colour. The greeny blue often next to the cliffs themselves. Maybe the more icy blue further out. Maybe the kind of more grey further still. There's a richness. Or take, for example, something you might see often at this time of year, a blackbird hopping across a bit of grass. You say, well, that's a blackbird. But if you stop and consider it, it's got a depth of beauty. Yes, there's the distinguishing orange beak and black plumage. But on further look, there's the piercing eye. There's the amber ring round the eye that makes it jump. And although, yes, it is a black bird, 
There are often streaks of brown, grey, even white at times in it. Stopping, intentionally noticing, gives us a deeper appreciation and a deeper joy. And really I think that's what we are trying to do today as we start to look at Jesus and his crucifixion. Maybe you remember I've said before that Mark in his gospel is very clever. At the beginning everything is immediately and fast and fast and fast. But by the end he slows right down. Hour by hour he wants us to see Jesus and this crucifixion and the significance of it. And we're going to do this over two weeks. We'll do it this week. And, and then next week. And there's so much for us to see. My hope is that as we stop, as we intentionally consider, as we appreciate Jesus and who he is and what he was doing there at the cross, that we might get a deeper appreciation of him. For us who are Christians, this is important. This is our Jesus, our Lord, the one we worship and adore, the one we trust has gone to the cross for us. And in stopping and considering the cross, we see such a depth, such a richness of what he endured. And so I think we are led to worship and appreciate him all the more. But maybe you're not a Christian and you're watching this, or you're not sure about Jesus. In fact, you might find it odd that we as Christians go on all the time about Jesus and we go on all the time about the cross. Well, it might be that between this week and next week, as you watch along, there's an opportunity for you to consider the significance of the central event of Christianity. And what a time to do it. It's Easter. And while the shops may be full of chocolate eggs and bunnies and other things, and while these things are fun, the true Christian Easter is much deeper than that. And in fact, we have found life-changing. Well, artists have their favourite colours. Other creative people have their favourite tools. Mark, the writer of this gospel, uses and paints in one of his favourite tools you could say today, which is irony. And I think as we look at the passage and walk through it line by line together, I think we're going to see three big ironies that Mark is using to give us that deeper appreciation of Jesus today. Let's have a look. Firstly, we see that Jesus is humiliated, but heroic. After Jesus' trials, he is taken away by the soldiers to the Roman palace. And we can imagine the scene to be like that that we may be seen in television before, where a criminal is taken away by the guards, by the police, to a darkened room, a room where there's definitely no CCTV, and they have at him. And that's what we see here, brutal as it is. Jesus is mocked. Take off his clothes, they give him a purple robe, and force a crown of thorns on his head, and mock him as king of the Jews. They bow in fake homage. They strike him and mock him and spit on him again and again and again. Now, while this is uncomfortable, grisly for us to think about, it is utterly humiliating for Jesus. You see, the whole thing of kingship has been a big part of Mark's gospel. From the beginning we were told that Jesus is the Christ, that is God's anointed king, or, or Messiah, it could be translated. That's been a part of who Mark wants us to see that Jesus is. At the halfway point of the Gospel there's this great moment where Peter, one of the disciples, realises that Jesus is the Christ. And Jesus' preaching and, and message has been all about the kingdom. And in fact, he's been saying the kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news. It's plain that Jesus is God's king. 
who is to bring healing and blessing in this broken world. To bring his rule. To bring a new rule of goodness and love. But over these last chapters of Mark, the whole notion of this kingship has been somewhat devalued and debased. This was the charge that the religious leaders brought Jesus to, to Pilate. And the notion of kingship was kind of devalued down so that Jesus was equated with a parochial freedom fighter, a usurper. And he's convicted. And he's mocked now and spat and beaten. And this whole idea of Jesus being a king is now somehow a joke. It's a point of humiliation because he's no king by human eyes. He's just a criminal. It is an entire and complete humiliation of Jesus. It's utter mockery. And the irony is, though, uncomfortable as it is, that Jesus is God's king. He really is the Christ. He may be rejected and shamed here, but he is God's king going on to complete God's mission. He is the son of God in obedience to the Father, going to the cross as he predicted. And in this, he is going to become a ransom for many, just as he said. He is not the hated criminal, but he is the vindicated king. He is, in fact, a hero. A hero who, bearing shame and scoffing rude, would go to be in our place, condemned. You can imagine, in the midst of this, how tempting it must have been for Jesus, the Son of God, to lash out. How tempting it must have been to close the mouths of the mockers, to stop them in their beating. And yet he doesn't. Because he knows he is the king and he is enduring this. He is becoming the suffering servant as was predicted by Isaiah the prophet so that God's plans might be complete. That he might be pierced for our transgressions. That he would take up our pain and bear our suffering. That he would be crushed for our iniquities. That he might bear the punishment that brings us peace, that by his wounds we would be healed. Jesus is the true hero here. He is truly heroic. Now, I don't mean hero in the sense that we might see Marvel superheroes, people who are like us, but a bit better, a bit stronger, a bit more powerful a bit more uh, rich and so able to do amazing things and crash and smash evil to overcome it. Now Jesus is a very different type of hero. He is the one who is to suffer and die and in his defeat to disarm, in his loss to win. This is God's plan and purpose for his Messiah. The, the great conquering king is to be the suffering servant. All these themes are coming together. And he is doing it utterly alone in humiliation. I guess a hero people might look to at the moment in the news is President Zelensky of Ukraine. Now, he is a very commendable man acting under immense pressure, doing a great amount of good. And while in a sense you can say he's alone, he has the Ukrainian people behind him. And he has a military and financial help of the world's greatest powers, almost. But here Jesus is so different. His willingness to continue on his willingness to take on this abuse, this derision, this humiliation, 
all for the sake of salvation, all in obedience to the Father, all for the sake of his own, is heroic in such a different category. And if we are Christians and thinking in Jesus here, we have to recognise he is our hero. He is our king. He is the Messiah that is ours. He is the one who has made the way for us. He's not to be admired off in the distance. But he wants us to come and worship and adore him. To, to seek him in prayer. To give our lives in humble service of him who first gave himself for us. And as we see what he endured, and as we appreciate the depth of that all the more, it should make us want to pour out our lives all the more in service of him and his kingdom. So our first irony is that Jesus is humiliated but heroic. The second is that he fails yet is fulfilling. In verse 21 we read of a man called Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. By the way, I think that probably means that Alexander and Rufus were known to the first readers of Mark's Gospel. It's their dad that we're talking about here. It may even be that this man Simon became a follower of Jesus after seeing Jesus suffering as he went to the cross. Whatever what we do see is that he is able to carry, he is given the charge to carry Jesus' cross. Probably not the full cross, probably just the horizontal beam carried on the back. But what this means is that Jesus isn't carrying the cross. And in a sense, you could say he's failing. He's not even able to do that. How weak. I realised earlier when I talk about Jesus being a hero, there is a danger that I misunderstood, that we think he is somehow triumphant as he does this. But he is not. He does not suffer in some ways any better than anyone else does. He stumbles and struggles. He doesn't even have the strength to carry the cross beam. He was weak. And in human eyes, it looks like he's failing. Jesus, who commanded the crowds before, who was able to conduct all these miracles, who said and did so much, is now able to do so little. In the Middle Eastern world, particularly, this would be embarrassing. And maybe even in our world today, if we tell people of Jesus and what weakness, they might say, well, you worship Jesus, really? <laughs> but the irony is, you see, even as he is failing, Mark shows us he is fulfilling the plan of God. There's a couple of little details in these verses that help us see that. The first is to do with this wine mixed with myrrh that he has offered. Now it's not clear exactly who's offering it. It would be unlikely to be the soldiers who had mocked him because this wine mixed with myrrh is probably drugged wine to take away the pain, to dull it. It may even be that the women somehow find a way to pass this to him or get someone to do it for them. It may seem an odd thing to be talking about at this point, an odd detail to include, but in Psalm 69 we're told of a righteous sufferer for whom this happens. Well, Jesus, I think, is showing, and Mark is showing us, that he is the righteous sufferer. He is the Christ, he is the suffering servant, he is the righteous sufferer. All these themes from the Old Testament coming to fulfilment. Now he refuses the mixture and again this is odd actually but I wonder and I think it's no more than that I wonder if 
That's a self-conscious act by Jesus to carry on to endure the cross in all the fullness of its horror. To fulfil what he said in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he would drink the cup of God's wrath to its bitter dregs. There's also a second fulfilment here. We read that the soldiers gamble for Jesus' clothes, which in itself is also a fulfilment of Psalm 22. Again, where there is a righteous sufferer, Jesus will quote Psalm 22 soon. And it's on his mind. And maybe it is, you see, that all these things are coming together to show us that Jesus isn't actually feeling. It looks like he's feeling, but he is in fact fulfilling all of God's promises, all of God's types and shadows, that he, the Christ, has come to this point to fulfil God's great plan of salvation. The irony is stark, of course. Jesus is doing it in seeming failure, but actual accomplishment. And God is working here to achieve his plan in a way which would confound the wisdom of the world and the whole way in which we normally work. Usually the heroes are the strong, the overcomers, not the losers, not the one who lose to their enemies and are gloated over and beaten and struck. But the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Well, we've seen two ironies, and now we come to the final one. Perhaps the the most dark, the most twisted, the most striking of them, which is that Jesus is rejected, but recognised. We're told that it was nine in the morning when they crucified him. And then we're told about the plate above Jesus' head, inscribed, this is the King of the Jews. Now we've thought a bit already about that designation, King of the Jews. But Mark draws our attention to it once more. It's again a mockery. But in a funny way, Jesus is recognised. In John's Gospel, we get a little bit more detail about this plate and people's reaction to it. We read, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. Chief priests of the Jews had protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. It seems, I think, that there was something that stuck, caught in the throat or in the mind of the religious leaders as they saw that in print. Although this was the designation that they used to convict Jesus and to mock him, when they see it written down, it annoys them. Maybe it is that actually they do know he is the king of the Jews. And we have this irony, rejected but recognised. We're also told about others around the scene. Jesus is crucified between two other criminals who hurl insults at him. Again, they reject him. And passers-by too. But the passers-by also say this thing about the temple. This mocking statement, this you who were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well again, as we thought the last few weeks, Jesus didn't actually say that. Yes, he said the temple would be destroyed. And yes, he said he would rise in three days. They are, are throwing this at him to mock him again. To reject him, to say you talk rubbish. But again, the irony is that this will actually be fulfilled. 
The temple itself will stand for many more years, but will be destroyed, as Jesus said. But actually, in the next days, it will become quite useless. Because, as we'll find out more next week, when Jesus dies, the curtain in the temple, the very symbol that sinful humanity cannot approach a holy God, is torn in two from top to bottom, and it is made obvious and clear that the way is now open to God by Jesus' death. So Jesus is doing what he claimed. And when he rises, it is like he has created a new temple, a new place where people can meet God in him. And so Jesus is mocked and rejected, but what he is doing is strangely recognised once more. And then we come to the worst of it. We come to these religious leaders again. And here is what they say. He saved others, but he can't save himself. And what they are saying is true. It embodies the the irony that we're seeing all through this passage at its most delicious, you might say, but maybe it's most disturbing. Yes, Jesus isn't saving himself. And yes, he is saving others. He is bearing sin in his body on the tree. He who knew no sin is made to be sin. His blood, being spilled on the wood of the cross, is a greater Passover lamb. He did not save himself. He saved others. Now we who are Christians who listen along to this know and glory in the fact that Jesus has accomplished this. But the religious leaders don't. They are so blind in their ignorance that they mock and continue to mock. They continue on to make ridiculous statements. In fact, they even called Jesus to come down off the cross, which is so wicked and so wrong, because here Jesus is saving others. He is being the Christ, the suffering servant, the righteous sufferer that God has intended to come and pay for sin. And they make a mockery of him. And they say, well, if you come down now, we'll see and believe. But again, the irony is there. I mean, what there is to see and believe is there, before them. But they are so blind. It is so dark, isn't it? It's so twisted, this scene. What is right is wrong, and wrong is right to them. And I just think, as we come to this point to stop today, although there's more to see about the cross next week, what we see is that Mark is trying, I think, to get us to see the horror, the twistedness, the wickedness of this, and the irony of this. But while humanity continues to reject Jesus, in a strange way they recognise him. Mark is drawing out to us what exactly is happening. And he is doing it that we might not reject Jesus. He is showing us Jesus in his suffering, in his humiliation, at the cross, that we might see what it is he is achieving as God's Christ. And that we might believe. That we might worship him. We might do exactly the opposite of those who were there on that day. That we would see that we need this saviour. And that this saviour has suffered immensely for us, bearing what we should bear before God because of our rebellion of God, our wickedness and our sin. And yet he has done it for us so that we might be embraced rather than rejected, that rather than being humiliated, we might be humbled but lifted up, that we might know his love and mercy and free access to the Father by him, that we might know this salvation for ourselves and come under him as our King, our Lord, our Master, 
And so the question we must finish with is this. You see how Jesus is treated here. But what will you do with Jesus? Yes, it looks like he's failing, but he is fulfilling. It looks like he's being humiliated, and he is, but he is a true hero. He is being rejected, but we are seeing exactly who he is. Will you trust in him for yourself? And if you have, will you glory in him all the more as you see the depth of what he has done for you? Lord Jesus Christ, we worship and adore you. We praise and thank you for enduring at the cross, embracing the humiliation and hurt and mockery, that you became that man of sorrows, that suffering servant, that righteous sufferer, the Christ, who completes the plan and mission of the Father, we just 
barely can grasp and wrap our minds around the horror of what you endured there, physically, socially, and yet we know more than anything you were enduring the cost of redemption, experiencing the very anger of the Father, that you were truly alone, like no one ever has been, and yet you did it for us. We love you and we thank you. We are sorry and mourn our sin that caused you to do that. Yet we glory in you, who died for us. And we recognise that as we have just sung, that we should never boast in anything else other than you, our Lord Jesus Christ crucified. This is our hope and our joy, the good news which inspires our lives and helps us to be transformed and changed. Help us this week to, to love and serve you purely out of hearts which know our redemption and the beauty and the cost of it. For your sake we ask. Amen. <laughs>